The Magic Show is brought to you by StarCityGames.com, and check this out. On May 14th and 15th, the StarCityGames.com Open Series comes to Orlando, and this event is going to be huge. We're talking hundreds of players, over $14,000 in cash prizes, at least 18 players qualified for their choice of either StarCityGames.com Invitationals. Live coverage all day, courtesy of SCG Live. Tons of side events and as much Magic the Gatherings we can pack into one weekend. So make plans to join StarCityGames.com in Orlando, and we'll see you there. All right, so this is Evan Norman live with the Charlotte Open, and... everybody and welcome to another edition of the magic show this week we're forced to get serious once again as one of the most significant bannings in the history of the game happened this week the new for xl leaks were revealed to come from none other than world champion guillaume matignon and runner-up guillaume wafo tapa you ready to go over this and what it means for our game let's go so where to start this week well let's begin with the facts Many years ago, there were these things called magic magazines made of dead trees and ink, and people in the U.S. actually bought and read them. Perhaps you've even done so yourself, you know, feel old school and retro. When these were relevant to magic back in the 90s, they were huge. I remember eagerly waiting for my inquest back in the day, hoping to read the tech earlier than anyone else at the store. Now, as you may or may not know, printed publications need serious lead-up time to hit street dates. We're normally talking six weeks or at least four weeks from written word to publication. That's a pretty long time, especially for those writing about magic, a game which changes so frequently. So what did Watsi do? Well, they would ship the publication a copy of the God Book, a document consisting of the entire list of cards. Writers can't write about a format they aren't aware of and the meta-shaking cards in the new set. As time went on, this became a PDF that had the full card images too. Now as print magazines in the US slowly died off, a shining beacon has been Lotus Noir, which in French is of course Black Lotus. This magazine has been with Magic since its inception in 1995 and is popular in France. At some point a few years ago, Guillaume Matignon began writing for them. I don't know the first issue he appeared in, but according to his confession, he's been doing so for years. Regardless, the fact is this. Matignon has received the entire Godbook for sets for years, weeks before any official spoilers begin, in order to write articles about upcoming formats. For New Phyrexia, Wizards did the same thing they always did, shipping the file to Lotus Noir who shipped it to Guillaume Gatignon. He had to write about the format as if New Phyrexia was already out, so of course he needed complete access, right? Well, he shares it with Guillaume Wafotapa, his roommate and best friend, who then gets a little fast and loose with the info. He gives it to at least one other person, who gives it to another, who then casually boasts about it on IRC, who casually spoils the entire set early. Soon after, the hammer comes down, and the two friends and Wafo Tapa get bannings until October 2012, and Guillaume Matignon is banned for three years. This is a big deal. This is the banning of a world champion. Let me try to explain how this might be a much more scandalous situation than we first imagined. Let's dive in. First, I want you to imagine that you have this information early. Yes, you are to write articles about the set in question and its impact. But to do that, you may want to build some decks and try some cards, right? What if your roommate is another Magic Pro? Surely you guys would test the cards together to see if they really work as well as advertised. Let's say you find a fantastic card before anyone else. The easiest example is Jace the Mind Sculptor. Imagine knowing what Jace does weeks before anyone knows he's even in World Wake. How would this impact your deck building decisions, your choice of deck, your gauntlet of testing? But let's get uncomfortable. How would this impact your pre-ordering habits? Let me make this clear. Before we go forward, I'm not saying Guillaume Matignon or Guillaume Wafotapa took financial advantage of their prior knowledge. But the fact that they have access requires us to ask the question. My point is that this is a terrible, horrible, no good idea to ship out the entire Godbook early to a print publication because they have to ship it to the writers who know what they're talking about, aka pros, and that in turn forces these types of questions raised when this gets out. All of these uncomfortable questions lead us to a conclusion. Wizards, I hope, will now institute a policy of never ever sending out godbooks to anyone that isn't an employee or cartamundi. 
the people who actually produce the cards. Star City Games has never gotten a copy of any God book and neither has any other website as far as I know. We are given strict guidelines and embargo dates with one or two spoilers tops. Providing God books to print magazines is a stupid, grandfathered-in program that needs to stop immediately. The idea that the Guillaumes and their buddies had a two-week head start on the Pro Tour Paris metagame is a real actual fear that could have a real impact on a tournament that gives away a quarter million bucks. Again, there is no evidence, but just having access makes us all wonder, and we should never ever have to wonder about this in the future. So the question is, what happens now? Well, the Guillaumes won't be writing for Star City Games until they're unbanned. Both of them just completely wrecked their chances for the Hall of Fame inclusion this year, if not forever, and lost a ton of trust and respect from Wizards and Lotus Noir. The community is arguably worse off for knowing the entire spoiler, with excitement and hype dampened by this leak, and Guillaume Matignon has essentially thrown himself at the community's mercy with his confession to Wizards proper. What do you guys think? This week's episode is more of a thinking man's piece than anything else, and your thoughts on the matter are appreciated. This week is a bit short, as I'm going to be filming the complete new Perexia video set review with Brad Nelson, something I'm super excited about, and I hope you guys are too. Until next time, Magic Players, this is Evan Irwin, tapping the cards so you don't have to. You see Standard every Friday, you kind of get used to it. Once you go to Legacy, the card pool just explodes and you have to like pick up cards and be like, what's this card do? It's the Legacy Grand Prix Trial Providence, but we're also giving away a Mox Emerald to first place and a Bizarre Baghdad to second place, plus additional in-store credit prices. Basically, it's probably 50% combo decks here, and my deck is completely geared towards beating combo decks. I'm playing a deck called Mean Deck Mud. Plays a lot of big artifacts and plays them quickly and tries to beat the opponent that way. I'm actually coming with the homebrew deck and it's show and tell Eureka with Brexian Dreadnought, Stifle, Moss War Bridge. I'm actually calling it Hogwarts because there's this guy online and that's the name he came up with. So I thought, you know, keep it with it. It's a tribal deck and it runs a bunch of merfolk and counter spells, uses Ether Vile to get them out for free and then use a standstill so when your opponent plays a spell, you get to draw cards and kind of spell whatever you played. Legacy attracts a very, very different format than standard. It usually attracts older players, for one. It's said to be more skill intensive, and I pretty much agree with that. Because overall, piloting the deck is huge, especially with the level of complexity with this deck, of these decks. And not only the complexity of your deck, but you have to understand the complexity of their deck. And because of that, and a number of decks, uh, you just have to have that amount of information. And for someone jumping in, it's going to be very tough. So usually you're going to have older, more seasoned players playing Legacy. I actually just got back into Magic about six months ago. And so I don't play Standard. I had all the cards to play Legacy. And so that's what I did. I started playing Legacy, looked at what decks were doing good, and really liked how Show and Tell was working. So I decided to go a little variation off of that. Don't see many Eurekas. And so I thought, you know, try to throw those in, see what I could do with them. Throw a lot more creatures in there, try to fill up the board quicker. <laughs> I like Legacy Format a lot. It's the most healthy format in all of Magic, by far. You can play any archetype you're interested in, there's a viable deck for it. Everything you can think of, like there's a Mono Green Stompy deck that's three and one here today. There's any flavor combo you wanna play. Storm combos, fine. Like there's that High Tide combo deck, which is like really good. There's aggressive decks, tribal decks, everything. Like. Because the cards are so powerful, you can tweak your decks to make it viable in the format. There's tons of room to innovate, create new decks, come into a metagame with something unknown and really do something fun. Yeah, I love Legacy. It's absolutely awesome. It's not overpowered like Vintage is, and you don't have to worry about trying to invest cards every single week for Standard. And most of the decks that are in the top rotate in and out, and there's a wide variety of decks to play. That's one thing I like most about Legacy is because you can really just play whatever you want. I think Legacy is a really good format. It's very broad, but I think there's six decks that are probably more powerful than the rest. It's great in that, but the other fact is, in honesty, although we say you can build from this giant pool, there's like only a handful of, I don't know, maybe less than, a, easily less than a thousand, let's say like 500 cards you actually will pull from, because those are the more powerful cards in Magic. 
and when you play, no matter what, the only top few cards are actually selected. Even in Standard, that's true. There's so many cards in Standard that you never touch. Just like in Legacy, is the same thing. Legacy is just so wide open that, I don't know, I can see it going pretty far as long as the prices don't keep jumping up ridiculously high. The prices are going way up and it's getting outrageous. I mean, before, when I started playing Legacy, you could get Dole Lands for 20 to $50, now they're 100 and there's cards that are just way too expensive. That is the essential issue problem with Legacy. You, one thing people have to realize, which is really weird to think about, is think of cards as actually an investment. It's very odd to think about that because Magic cards actually are pretty easy to pick up and drop. If you pick up a dual land for 50 bucks, you probably can sell that dual land right back down for 50 bucks pretty easily. You can't say that about a lot of other things. You can't like buy a golf club and sell it for almost the exact same amount you bought it after you even used it slightly. Like, you can't do that. So you have to view it as like a long-term thing. You have to like build your things out over time. Judge time. You have a misdirection targeting pack negation. Okay. And it's, okay. It's pretty much what it comes to is legacy becomes like the same price as vintage or something like that. That's what are the levels where the legacy will stop like flatting. It's just not healthy for the format. So something needs to be done in the next few years for, for our format to survive. I don't think there's much to do about it unless Wizards abolishes the reserve list, which they're pretty much not going to do. Card availability is a problem with an eternal format and that it's limits the growth of it, which is unfortunate. Maybe we'll get some kind of solution from Wizards of the Coast, but they're about the only ones who can provide one.